Hare Krishna, dear devotees, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to Guru Maharaj. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, today we have a very special session with uh, Her Grace Chiti Sekti Devi Dasi Mataji from London uh, joining us. Uh, and today uh, Mataji is going to enlighten us on the topic uh, of overcoming uh, uh, challenges in serving the spiritual master. So this is a three-part series. Uh, Mataji has kindly agreed uh, um, uh, to give um, uh, this series of classes to all of us. And um, so this series is going to be starting from today, September 6th, another one in September 20th, and one. the last part will be on September 27th, Mondays. So, and um, before hand over, handing over the call to Mataji, I just want to give a brief introduction. Um, I'm sorry, one second. Um, so, I just want to give a, a brief introduction of uh, uh, Mataji for my purification. Um, so, Chiti Sekti Devi Dasi Mataji has been practicing Krishna consciousness for over 25 years. Based in London, UK, she serves as a preacher, mentor, and Sangha leader. She is a trustee for Bhaktivedanta Manor and for the Institute for Appl Applied Spiritual Technology. She also serves as the chair for the Mental Disorders Subcommittee of Bhaktivedanta Medical Association. Graduating from Imperial College as a medical doctor and specializing as a consultant psychiatrist, she brings together over two dec decades of experience in scientific advances in mental health with Krishna consciousness and connects with a diverse audience of students, celebrities, politicians, healthcare professionals, and corporate leaders. She regularly broadcasts for BBC Radio on mental health, well-being, and spirituality with over 200 million listens. She features on TV and in a number of newspapers and magazines and has contributed to several books and papers. Hare Krishna. Uh, Mataji, please accept my humble obeisances. All to Srila Prabhupada. And good Thank, you. Thank you so much for accepting um, our invitation and coming over and giving this wonderful uh, class on wonderful topic, uh, Mataji. Um, thank you so much. Once again, uh, please take over the call. It's all yours. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you so much for uh, the warm welcome. Uh, please, uh, can you join me? We'll together chant Mangalarshanam and invoke the blessings of Guru and Parampara so that we can share something uh, and we can inspire each other. Om Gyanti Mirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militamena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Sapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gadamayam Dadati Sapadantikam Andeham Shri Guru Shri Tapadakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitam Scha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Vishabhanus De Devi Panamami Hari Priya Panjakalpa Trubhischa Kripa Sindhu Bevacha Patitanam Bhavanebhyo Krishna Vipyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare so um, yes, thank you once again for the invitation. Okay, I have one small request. Could uh, a few people please turn on their cameras? Because you know I, you are all so fortunate that your spiritual master, His Holiness Chandra Mori Maharaj, is so gracious to all of you that he does a call for you every single day at this time and makes himself so available. So I appreciate the intimacy uh, of this group and this closeness. Uh, but 
if I could have a little piece of that by having some of your cameras on, it will um, help me uh, because I will get your blessings and permissions to, permission to speak. Um, now, this three part series, uh, first part today and then the uh, next two parts on the 20th and the 27th, um, we're focusing on overcoming the challenges we might face when serving the spiritual master. And these challenges um, are of one type when we are personally serving the Guru in their physical presence. They're of a different type, perhaps, when the Guru is still on the planet, but we may be geographically uh, at a different, uh, in a different space. And they're still of another type of challenge when the Guru is no longer physically present at all, um, but is present in their instructions. So serving the spiritual master is the secret to success in spiritual life and you know i'm no expert on this area i'm still learning myself uh but by your guru Maharaj's mercy i've been given permission to share uh, my experiences serving bhakti Maharaj whilst traveling with with him and also uh, being his caregiver in the last uh, five months of his time on the planet so i hope i can share something that inspires you to be of greater service to your spiritual master and deepens your service. And in this way, I can attract your mercy and blessings in my service. So please forgive any mistakes. And please, you know, this is your space. This daily call is your home. So if uh, you want to give feedback, correct, or even make suggestions for next time, they're more than welcome. So today's session is really going to focus, first of all, on this principle and person of Guru Tattva. What do we understand by Guru Tattva? You know, this, this phrase is, is thrown around a lot. We speak about it a lot, Guru Tattva, Guru Tattva. But we, uh, you know, I know there's courses on the Guru Disciple relationship, which often people attend before taking initiation. We also have Bhagavad Gita, Krishna instructing Arjun that we should try and learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master, inquiring from him submissively, and rendering service unto him. The self-realized souls can impart knowledge onto us because they've seen the truth. So how does the principle and the person of Guru Tattva manifest in our lives? Now, the fact that you're all here and interested in this um, aspect of the Krishna consciousness means you've gone past the initial hurdle of deciding whether you actually should have a spiritual master. Right? You're all at a space where you either have taken initiation, you're aspiring, or you're aspiring to aspire. Uh, what does this mean? You know, aspiring to aspire, initiation, surrender, they are part of a spectrum. I mean, ideally, initiation means full surrender. But that's really when we're fully, you know, we've fully accepted diksha and shiksha from the spiritual master, when we've fully surrendered. What does that full surrender look, look like? It's the degree to which we have a willingness or are prepared to accept unplanned and undesirable change in our life in the pursuit of our Krishna consciousness. That is actually what we're signing up for. When we accept spiritual master, when we accept a guru wholeheartedly, we are wholeheartedly prepared or willing to accept change. That change will come. That change may take a few days it may take a few weeks it may take a few years but guru inevitably if the guru disciple relationship is working on both sides there will be change there will be change in the heart and there will be change in the life that is to be unexpected and we often make the biggest advancement when we are willing to surrender to change which is outside of our plan which may even be undesirable because we don't have foresight but this idea of Guru Tattva, what is it? Tattva means energy, principle, paradigm, or truth. What are we talking about here? So just a little bit of philosophy before we kind of get into the practicality of this. So we understand from philosophy, we have Vishnu Tattva. So even though every living being is an expansion of Krishna, okay? Vishnu Tattva are those expansions of Krishna where there's no difference between Krishna and his expansions. So always superior. Then there's Jiva Tattva. We are also expansions of Krishna, but we're tiny expansions. So we are always subordinate. Okay, whether that's conscious or unconscious, 
we're always subordinate. Now, one may argue, well, hang on a minute, but when we're pure devotees, Krishna is subordinate to us. Yes, he is, but he still always trumps us because the fact that he's willing to be subordinate, subordinate to us means he's actually superior <laughs> because he beats us, he trumps us with his love and his humility. So no matter how hard we try, we are subordinate, but that subordination is completely out of love. We also have Shakti Tattva, we understand that external energy, the internal energy, the marginal energy. So there's all these different energies and tattvas, okay? But those, you know, Krishna's always looking at ways to engage the living entity in his service, service connection with love, okay? Whether it's physically here in this material plane away from him or in Goloka Vrindavan or many other places where he performs his pastimes. But Guru Tattva is actually that principle or energy by which Krishna actually engages all loving beings in his service. How do we make sense of that? In both our service here and our eternal service, the Guru Tattva or Guru principle is there. Here we cannot directly approach Krishna, even though we really want to, I, I just want to have a direct relationship with Krishna. Why does there have to be this middle man, right? You know, middle woman or middle person or middle people, you know, why, why do I have to follow a book? Why do I have to follow a person? Why can't I just directly communicate with Krishna myself? Okay, so we have these interferences, the mind, the ego, our sense of who we are here. That's why we can't. And so the, intel the point of intelligence comes when we understand that and accept and just going back to this principle of I'm prepared or willing to accept unplanned and undesirable change instructed by somebody who connects me with Krishna. So this principle of how Krishna engages us in his service, known as Guru Tattva, takes place here certainly, but it also continues even in our eternal service. The only thing is, because we have no barriers of envy or selfishness um, or greed, every aspect of ourself is able to experience everything fully and so even if we are not directly serving the lord we are serving through the servant of the servant of the servant the ecstasy the joy the relish relishing of the rasa that happiness that takes place between krishna and us is felt fully even if it's not directly and we can experience that too in guru's service and and we'll go into that more as we get into the later sessions so Guru Tattva, actually Guru is the place where we meet Krishna. Guru is the place where we meet Krishna. When we are ready to be engaged in Krishna's loving service, Krishna sends Guru. He sends somebody who is, who is endowed with Guru Tattva, with the energy to become a meeting place for us and Krishna. When I was thinking about the way this has been phrased, that the guru is the meeting place for us in Krishna, and I can't take any credit for that phrase. I all, all glory to His Holiness Radha Maharaj for that phrase that guru is the meeting place for us and um, Krishna. How is this? So, Guru Tattva ultimately rests in Krishna and actually ultimately in Lord Balaram, who is the original guru. Why? Because in Krishna's pastimes, eternal, his Nitya Leela and his Bhumi Leela, actually everything, all the facility that's required to serve Krishna is an expansion of Balaram. The abode of Vrindavan is a manifestation of Balaram. So this Guru Tattva principle or energy rests in Balaram. And because Balaram, you know, mood, shakti, task, love offering, relationship with Krishna is to constantly make arrangements for us to meet him, for us to serve him. So actually, this is what the guru is doing. This expands, this manifests, this uh, appears in the form of the person and many people who are providing us shiksha. And then also diksha guru who also gives us nam or mantra. So Actually, in the Guru's Vapu, in the Guru's Vani, the Guru's physical presence, the Guru's instruction. The Guru in this world and our Guru in the eternal world. 
Guru Tattva is the place where we meet Krishna. Because those souls who are pointing us in the direction of Krishna are blessed and empowered by the Acharyas and by Krishna to carry Guru Tattva. They're endowed with Guru Tattva, they're empowered with Guru Tattva. So yes, they're Jiva Tattva, but they're Jiva Tattva with an additional Guru Tattva. So it's, um, and our instructions on the principles of Guru Tattva, yes, the principles are there in Shastra, but how these principles manifest, how we live them, how they're, how they're experienced, these are given by our Acharyas. Okay, we look at the Goswamis, we look at Lord Chaitanya's teachings and they, how they were propagated by the Acharyas. These give us a real life experience of how is it that our meeting with Krishna in this life, even at the sadhana bhakti stage, can be a preparation and can be just as sweet as in our Krishna. I think we lost her. Yes. I'm here? Yes, yes. Sorry, when did you lose me? Um, just about uh, two seconds back, Mataji. Nothing much. Yeah. You didn't I just lose too much. Okay. So I think the first thing we have to remember in our service to our spiritual master that a Guru Tattva is not just limited to one person. Yes, we can take Shiksha from so many, even if we take Diksha from one person. Um, and in this mood, actually, we also see the rest of our God family. Now, often we see God family as peers, unless they are obviously very much older than us, or obviously have been around a lot more than us, or obviously have um, some sort of designation or position that makes it easy for us to accept them as senior and maybe be able to take shiksha. But otherwise, actually, this guru principle, the principle of guru tattva, uh, comes through everyone and anyone that we are willing to take shiksha and instruction from because actually ultimately they're also uh, acting in one sense on behalf of the, of the original guru of Balaram and so it will be in the pursuit of even what well, spiritual master whether it's diksha guru at the moment or aspiring to have his diksha guru has manifested so um, just a little bit more on the guru and the disciple relationship. How do we choose a guru? How do we know our guru is perfect? How do we know how far our guru can take us? Actually, the, the, the test is very simple. Now, as I was saying earlier, that person who points us towards Krishna. Okay, in this verse 434, inquiring submissively, rendering service. Why? Because they've seen the truth. They're self-realized. Our spiritual master, is perfect at also inquiring submissively and rendering service because the perfect guru is also the perfect disciple and so they're the perfect disciple to a perfect guru they're inquiring submissively and rendering service to a self-realized soul who can show them the truth because they've seen it so holding this in our hearts and understanding this is one thing but how does it manifest in our lives once we've found that person because so many other things, so many other desires come up and we may inadvertently be looking to our gurus to fulfill those desires. Because actually the spiritual master very clearly is not there as our psychologist. They're not there to as our marriage counselors. They're not there as a careers advisor. OK, often we are attracted to maybe gurus for those reasons. Right? We're thinking, oh, they give really good practical advice about this. They give really good practical, you know, I, I think I can become more mentally peaceful if I surrender to my spiritual master, or maybe they'll be able to direct me so I'm very comfortable in my material situation. So this is the thing, if the more we start to make our relationship with the guru about our circumstances here, the less we take shelter of Guru Tattva. And the more we take shelter of the person who Guru Tattva is manifesting through, which is why we can experience so many challenges in our relationship with the spiritual master and fulfilling the spiritual master's instructions. You know, I was just um, reflecting on this, how the, the guru is the perfect disciple. And 
I remember early on, very soon after I got initiated, um, back to Dr. Marsh was staying with us. And he'd flown in from, I think the other side, I think he'd come from South America or something. So there was jet lag. And the first couple of nights I noticed he was taking a rest very late. And I was finding that even if I was getting up in the middle of the night to go through the bathroom, his, the light was shining from under his door as well. And I didn't think anything of it the first couple of nights. And then I asked him the third night, I said, oh, you know, Guru Maharaj, is everything okay? You, you seem to be up very late. And first he kind of brushed it off with, oh yeah, it's just jet lag. But after a few more days, I thought, this, this is continuing. Surely the jet lag is, you know, settled by now. And uh, so I asked him again. And he said, do you, do you want to know why I'm awake? I said, yeah, I do actually want to know why you're awake because I'm actually worried because you're pushing yourself all day. And in fact, Dr. Maharaj, he would eat only once a day as well. And he would be engaged completely outside of that. And he said, you know, every morning when I wake up, I make a list for all the things that I'm going to do for my spiritual master. So he's already thinking how to render service to Srila Prabhupada every day. It's been decades since Srila Prabhupada left the planet. But every day he wakes up and makes a list of how to serve Srila Prabhupada. What am I going to do for Srila Prabhupada? He says, and then last thing at night, I go back to my list and I tick off everything that I've done. And the things that are outstanding, I will stay up and complete them unless it has to wait until the next day. And I was blown away. He was basically instructing me how to be a disciple by example. He didn't say to me, make a list of everything you have to do for me each day and then don't go to sleep until you've finished it all. He was showing me that actually, if you're a real disciple, this is how I mean, I'm sure he had, you know, he had no ego. He was very humble. He, he may or not have even intentionally been doing that, but this is what was coming through very strongly. And I remember the, the next visit, he came a few weeks later, I think a few months later. And I was sitting in the room and I was doing some secretarial administrative stuff with his emails. And he said to me, Shakti, yeah, yes, Gurudev, he said, do you want to help me with my list for Prabhupada? I was so excited. I was like, yeah, yes, I want to help you with your list for Prabhupada. And he sent me off to the post office to do some task. And he sent me, I went walking. And as I was walking, at first I was really excited. I was like, wow, you know, he's engaging me in completing his list for Prabhupada. And then my mind went, yeah, but like normally you do like more intense service than this for him. And he gives you bigger tasks. To, this is such a small thing he's given you to do. And then I had this experience and I feel like it was his blessing to understand this in the heart. I went, actually, from the moment you showed your willingness your openness to have your life changed by his instructions he started engaging you in serving his spiritual master and completing his list there is no need to see it as a whole separate thing and so my facial expression if you you know you would have seen it first excited and then confused and then excited and then you see me walking down that street so this is the the guru is uh our perfect example of how we should be as disciples. I mean, there are different standards of guru, just as there are different types of disciples. And I'm sure all of you know this, if you haven't listened to them, but uh, please do listen to them. Chandra Moli Maharaj, I think he has a five part seminar on the guru disciple relationship. I think he gave it in 2014, it's on his website. I'm sure you've all listened to it. And if you haven't, please do listen to it. But just to recap um, some of these things, uh, and I'm taking what I'm uh, sharing from one of Bhakti Dirta Maharaj's classes that he gave on the guru disciple relationship. He, um, he spoke about three different types of guru. And this is really echoes what we know from Nectar in of Instruction in terms of uh, levels of devotee, in terms of Ganishtha, Madhyam, and Uttam. Now, Prabhupada recommends that ideally our spiritual master should be Uttam or at least high level Madhyam. But if we look at it in a more um, understandable or easier to apply way right in practical circumstances the, the phrase that Paita Maharaj uses is there's the third class guru who has both feet firmly in the material world the second class guru who has one foot in the material world and one in the spiritual world and the first class guru who has both feet in the spiritual world what does that mean you know what does this mean uh so two feet in the material world means yes Guru is there, Guru is following everything that their spiritual master has set out for them and is teaching accordingly. 
but with both feet in the material world means that there is a lot of work still to be done on that individual themselves and so there is a vulnerability to fall down okay because there 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 is an as stronger protection with one foot in the spiritual world and one foot in the material world one is rarely rarely extremely rarely vulnerable to fall down because actually they're quite secure in who they are and who they're who they're becoming and it's just some last few things and uh, before they pull their uh last foot out of the material world and then last but not least but most importantly the the guru who has both feet securely in the spiritual world there, there's never fall down this is the nitya siddha this is the nitya siddha who may have come into this world as a nitya siddha or at the very least has become an itisiddha during this particular lifetime. Because Guru also evolves, Guru also grows. And we as disciples can either help that and contribute to that, or we can hold the spiritual master back. Now Guru Maharaj would often, you know, speak about this saying that, you know, it doesn't just benefit you for you to become Krishna conscious. It also benefits me. We see this when the Guru initiates, right? So many Gurus get unwell after giving Diksha because there is this karmic exchange, this sense of I'm taking responsibility to connect you to this direct line to Krishna. You know, you're now part of this chain. But in order to connect you, I also remove some of the obstacles and many of the obstacles that have blocked you from connecting. So it's not just a one way relationship, it's two ways. So our consciousness also impacts the Guru. I remember in one class, uh, Guru Maharaj talking about how the spiritual master is careful and very discerning about which disciples they keep as personal servants and in their close proximity. So there's one type of disciple where the Guru keeps the fool because this person is so foolish and so covered that actually the only way to break through that foolishness and um, covering is for them to be closely around the spiritual master where the spiritual master's purity and instruction can directly cut through it. Now that's risky because if the person doesn't learn, it often leads to fall down. And that's why we hear and we see that many of Prabhupada's personal servants really struggled in their spiritual life later on and many also left so, so there's 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 um you know because there's so much room for offense because when when that purity is there it cuts like a knife through the nonsense and for us when our nonsense is cut through like a knife in the mind or the false ego it's hurt it hurts it's painful um and then offenses which are born of over familiarity take place and he said the second type of person the spiritual master keeps closely around them is the person who's actually the disciple who's clean, who's actually easy to be around because there isn't so much conflict between the Guru's consciousness and the disciple's consciousness because the disciple surrendered. The disciple has a very open heart, a very strong willingness to accept change, whether it's unplanned or undesirable, anything that the spiritual master feels is beneficial in pointing that disciple in Krishna's direction. But we also then have our qualities, our qualifications, you know, the fourth class disciple, the third class, the second class, and the first class. The first class disciple being the one who is so attuned to the Guru's instructions that they don't even need to be asked to execute the instruction. The second class disciple needs to be told the instruction but executes everything enthusiastically and this second class disciple stage is important to go through because if we don't have this training where we are enthusiastically serving based on instruction it becomes a little bit more challenging to know the heart of the spiritual master and know the instructions fully having said that it's not only that way because there are many disciples who haven't had so many uh, interactions with their spiritual master but because of the power of guru tattva and it being largely an internal process they know what the spiritual master wants and they make sure that they keep many uh shiksha gurus who are in line with that to consolidate and to clarify then you have the third class disciple who is needs to be told what to do but does it begrudgingly uh which is not such a healthy situation and then the fourth class 
who has to be told what to do, but actually is indifferent, doesn't even follow those instructions. So if we're honest with ourselves, unless one is completely surrendered, um, it is hard to sustain second class, let alone get to first class. Okay, you may even find at times that you're being told what to do, but you find you're begrudging what you've been asked to do. And other times you've been told what to do and you may not even, it's like nobody said anything to you at all. It's like it just doesn't happen. And I wanna come back to that because this is all about overcoming our obstacles in our service to our spiritual master. So we'll come back to that later because this is about how I can serve you. So I wanna do a little bit of workshopping around this uh, and a little bit of introspection. So on the background of this, there's three types of gurus and four types of disciple. And the fact that the Guru Tattva is bestowed upon those souls who are willing to help uh, point other souls in the direction of Krishna. Even if there are discrepancies in the person, spiritual master, and I'm, I'm by no means saying this is something you have to consider here. But if you've read somewhere, you know, other gurus may have fallen down and that's putting doubt in your mind or makes you question anything. But actually for a disciple, as an individual practitioner, Guru Tattva can't be killed off. Guru Tattva doesn't fall down. The principle of Guru doesn't fall down. Balaram never falls down. You know, Prabhupada never falls down. He doesn't leave us. So even if for, un, you know, for, in unforeseen circumstances, for whatever reason, a particular individual is not able to continue to be endowed and empowered with Guru Tattva, that does not mean that we have lost our connection with Guru Tattva. However, what's more common, because that's actually quite unlikely to happen, what's more common is how often do we disconnect from Guru Tattva by disobeying the orders of the spiritual master. Because it's not just that once we're initiated, that's it, we're, we're set for life. This person's responsible for me eternally. So if I space out in this lifetime, either they're gonna come back or they're gonna send someone else. Oh, they're so kind, it's so lovely. It's not a sentimental thing. Actually, if we don't follow, the guru is well within their rights to actually say, I'm no longer your spiritual master. And Pax Maharaj, he spoke about this often. He would say that, you know, I, because he, he had a very eclectic style of preaching, an eclectic audience. So we have a very mixed bag, very and diverse God family group from all walks of life and from all parts of the world. Uh, he said, you know, because of this, I'm, I can be quite lenient and generous in terms of accepting disciples. He said, but I expect them to follow. And he said, and if they don't follow, then I will take back their name. And their beads and we knew he did that uh we knew he did that he um did that had to do that for many disciples in one particular country because i mean for example in africa he was initiating villages of disciples so hundreds of people at a time and if they didn't follow for a prolonged period even after many instructions even after much support he took back their names so Actually, the mood, even if we understand there's different levels of guru, but actually, if we want to get disconnected, then we only have ourselves to blame, really. It's never anyone else's fault, really, if we get disconnected from the relationship with the spiritual master. But guru is also very kind because guru also takes us back if they see that we've made a mistake. So authenticity in the guru-disciple relationship is very, very important. Um, I'm just looking at time. It's 4.35. I want to move on to a little workshopping because there are some other things I wanted to point out, but I think we could actually leave them for the se sessions on Vapu and Vani. I have a question for all of you, just so that we can make the best use of today and the next two sessions. In your relationship with your spiritual master, whoever it may be, what do you personally find is a challenge for you? First of all, in executing the instructions of a spiritual master. And secondly, in terms of having a willingness 
or being prepared to have your life completely changed. I mean, when you hear oh, being completely willing to have my life completely changed, even if it's undesirable and unplanned by my spiritual master, does that excite you? Does that fill you with a bit of fear like, oh, okay, that's a bit scary. And if it, if it is a bit scary, what's scary about it? Think, think of what comes to mind that you think, oh gosh, if I lost that, or if that changed, I think I'd find it really difficult to practice spiritual life. You know, so two things. What, what do you find for you personally when Guru instructs you, you find it hard to fulfill the instruction? And secondly, what are you filled with in your heart when you hear this concept that actually I'm willing to accept any change that my Guru brings about in my life in the service of Krishna? It's not going to be just one feeling. I'm sure you're going to feel many, many feelings. So I want you to just sit with it, maybe make a couple of notes. And then I'd love to hear from uh, some of you, either your reflections or realizations, and then we can move to some questions. Krishna Chiti Shakti Mataji, thank you so much for the wonderful session. Really, really enjoyed it. It was very thoughtful and well prepared. Very nice uh, class. Thank you very so much. Uh, it's really nice, actually, when we talk about, you know, uh, Guru giving instructions. Because um, uh, Chandramali Maharaj is only Chandramali Maharaj is very, very kind. And he, you know, he always says that, you know, Grastas, you just, you know, focus on deity worship, chant nicely, read uh, Srila Prabhupada's books. So he hasn't like maybe given many instructions or any instructions to me, but he's always told me to focus on deity worship. I felt like, uh, as you said that you all, you had, you know, uh, personal instruction instructions with your you know, Guru Maharaj and you spent time with him. And I always felt and had a desire that, you know, and I always talk to Guru Maharaj about this, that I always feel that I had wish I had more, you know, more of your personal association and to spend more time with you to know you, like, you know, me more or maybe, you know, because I've always felt that, you know, if my guru is going to take me back, that he should know me well, like, you know, what type of person I am and if I'm making any mistakes in my spiritual life and things like that. So service wise, I always felt that, you know, if I wish I could give some, get some instructions from him and uh, I always feel like, you know, I miss, I miss him basically, you know, because I just miss that association or maybe being a female that uh, you're not allowed to, you know, go that near to, you know, guru, your spiritual master and talk to him. So personally, what you can, you wish to, you, you could do. So yeah, that's what <laughs> and uh, self my realization have been with my spiritual master that yeah i wish i had more you know instructions maybe a proper instruction instruction <laughs> so i'm i'm thank you so much uh, mataji for uh, opening up the discussion i'm hearing a few things there uh, one is i think something that is commonly felt that um, i wish i had some personal instruction or had more instructions our mind tells us that for some reason our guru loves us more if there's more instructions, if there's a long list of instructions, um, or that it's very specific to our particular circumstance. But actually, this is not the case. This is a product of the mind. Uh, this is the mind not being our friend, because every instruction given to us by the spiritual master, even if they've only ever given us one, is completely fully infused with the potency of Guru Tattva, I was in the ability to execute it fully. You know, with the instruction comes the empowerment to fulfill it to the degree that we surrender to that instruction. But the way the mind interferes is it tells us that, okay, well, you only got one instruction, whereas so-and-so Darcy, she got five. Oh, and then so-and-so Das got an instruction which is specifically about their life. So Guru Maharaj must know so-and-so Das really, really well. And he just doesn't know me very well. Do you know how many different identities we've all been through with our mind coming up with these same tricks and slowing our spiritual life down and, and interfering with our relationship with the spiritual master? Yes, it's helpful for the Guru to know our circumstances in this life, but it's not essential. This is often a trick of the false ego because ultimately our relationship with Krishna doesn't really depend on who we are and what we do here. So I'm just gonna, um, just it, your, your question reminded me of how, you know, we're all given instructions at initiation, right? 
chant 16 rounds, follow the four principles of freedom. That's five there in itself. <laughs> okay. And in terms of instructions that are there specifically around our life, the Guru's trying to create a meeting place for us with Krishna in this world where it's easy for us to meet with Krishna. When we take those five instructions very seriously, then the Guru can set about making more changes if necessary. If necessary. So actually, specificity of an instruction or number of instructions are not a reflection of how much the Guru cares about us, how much the Guru knows us, or how much the Guru loves us. Having said that, sometimes Krishna intervenes directly. I remember receiving one email from Guru Maharaj. He went into a particular area of my life and gave me a very direct instruction and, and advice. And he ended the letter with, you're probably wondering why I wrote to you about this topic. Given that you've never ever spoken to me about it. Know that sometimes, if it's necessary, Krishna directly gives the guru information about the disciple. But I do empathize and I understand, uh, and I, I really feel for your experience. I've been there. We've, I think we've all been there. This, this feeling of uh, do more instructions mean he loves me more? Do they do, does knowing my personal circumstances mean the connection is deeper? Actually, the connection, the depth of connection is really seen in how is our willingness to accept change in Krishna and Guru's service growing? How much is the pleasure in fulfilling Guru's instructions outweighing the pleasure of fulfilling our function here? So, and as, as Grahasthas, sometimes we can feel a little bit like, oh, I'm a bit separated from the Guru because I can't go here, there and everywhere and travel at the drop of a hat. And sometimes as females, we might feel my body is a hindrance, an obstruction because of etiquette. But the Guru-Disciple relationship is ultimately, again, looking at it as the meeting place between us and Krishna, is beyond those things. And I've seen that personally in my own, own experience. I've seen it around me where devotees who have a very, very strong desire to serve the spiritual master personally. It doesn't matter if that spiritual master has five disciples or a thousand disciples, whether that guru even lives in the country or lives on the other side of the world. When that desire for that personal service is very strong, somehow the arrangements are made. But in the, you know, one of the realizations I had with the, with serving Guru Maharaj in that very intense time in those final few months was that actually our closeness with the spiritual master is very deeply rooted in our sincere endeavor to be in the kind of consciousness where we can be the spiritual master's puppet. What do I mean by this? The way I experienced it is there were times when literally, Guru Maharaj was literally right next to me, but my mind and heart were somewhere else. And I felt like he could have been in Timbuktu, even though he was physically right next to me. There were other times when I was with him and, or maybe I was on the other side of the country or on the other side of the world where there was a much more stronger connection with this willingness to, to surrender to anything and to be used how he wished. And it felt like he was right next to me. And when Prabhupada says, you know, maybe some of you heard this, Prabhupada would say that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he feels his presence right by his side all the time. Why? Because he was completely always 24 seven absorbed in how can I be available for my spiritual master's wishes to be fulfilled. You know, Guru Dev, thy will be done. So if we resent the body that we're in, if we resent the situation that we're in, in when it comes to fulfilling the spiritual master's instructions, it actually becomes a block in being able to receive the empowerment that comes with uh, the instruction that the Guru gave. Because what we're saying in our mind is, 
Gurudev, I know you've given me the instruction and the empowerment with which to fulfill it, but actually, I don't think you've got it right. Because if you'd got it right, you'd give me more instructions or I wouldn't be in this situation. This is what the mind's saying. I'm not saying you're saying this or thinking this very consciously. This is what the mind does with the resentment. It pushes the empowerment away, right? Do you res I wish I wasn't in a female body. I wish, I wish I wasn't married. Why can't my kids just hurry up and grow up? And we think about the days when we'll be free again. <laughs> so, so just, just a, a few things. I don't know if what I've said is helpful, but I'd love to just to hear back if you've taken anything from that, if you've had any other realizations of what we've just discussed. This is so true. It's very reassuring, actually. Very, very nice what you said. Um, uh, thank you so much, actually. And the last point, what you said that when, you, you know, when you're close to the, your guru, and you're physically you know present and last time i felt that that uh, when uh, he caught covid and i was really really you know very sad that time that you know how i wish i could go and serve him and uh, i made so many attempts to go and see him stay with him but everything was failed he denied that no you cannot come here at any cost like you just cannot come and come here and after one month i got a call and i had been worried about him after one month, I got a call from him directly. He said that I just had a you know feeling that I need to talk to you, and and I was really touched. As this is you know this is definitely a scientific moment. How could he know you know he knew that you know that I really wanted to talk to him and hear his voice, and uh, it's just so beautiful. It's yeah, that's very true actually. That you know even though if you are close to him, you can be far away, and if even if you're far away, you can be very close to him. And about the instructions as well, you're, you're actually very right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Mataji. I really like your energy. Um, absolutely. It's a wonderful um, talk that you're giving us. And every, every sentence is nectar. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I... Okay, I have I got initiated online and I have had very little direct interaction with my Guru Maharaj. Mostly I have been listening to his talks that he gives online from Hungary. And um, one of my one of my um, devotee friend told me that the Guru Maharaj doesn't need to give you direct specific instruction, even if he's talking in a group and giving instructions in a group, you should focus and think that that instruction is for you. You will know if that instruction is for you. And yesterday I happened to meet him in very, for the first time. Um, and he was telling someone else that, are you doing any art? And later my husband comes in, did you hear that? What Guru Maharaj said, are you doing any art? And I used to paint when I was younger but um life happened so i'm not painting much anymore and um i somehow felt that that was probably for me um mm. so um, i don't know if this is right way or wrong way but um, maybe again the mind is playing tricks but um how do we know yeah even if we understand that the instruction is is in a group how do we know it is for me so the, the prince, that's a really nice question. So the, the principles on which our relationship with the guru is, is are based on, you know, uh, executing our bhajan kriya, our sadhana bhakti, according to the instructions of the spiritual master, are actually the foundation upon which we can gain clarity to hear from guru within and external guru. So guru sadhu shastra, whether they're shiksha guru, diksha guru, sadhus around us, and Shastra are the external manifestation. They give us practical clarification on whether what we're hearing is specifically for us. Because actually, everything that comes out of the spiritual master's mouth is an instruction. But there are certain things which are meant for everybody, and there are certain things which are meant for only some people. You know, they're like the fine tuning because they're specific to that one person, depending on where they're at. So the first basic way we can ensure that our mind doesn't block or the blockage is to a minimum is executing those first five instructions properly. We minimize the lot, you know, it, it's, it's actually a real shame 
that we seem to, after initiation, our mind starts to minimize the importance of the very vows that we got initiated on, right? the very vows we took, almost like they're not good enough. Everybody has these instructions. How can they be so special? I want something that sets me apart. Right? This is, again, it's the dialogue of the mind and the false ego. What's going to set you apart? What instruction is going to set you apart? At the same time, I appreciate that it helps all of us live um, in a more Krishna conscious way if we feel engaged day to day in activities that we feel that the guru would be pleased with, right? So it feels like, okay, sadhana bhakti fills a certain amount of time of our day. The rest of the day, if my guru had given me a specific instruction on what to do with the rest of the day, I would feel more confidence that I'm following the spiritual master's instructions. But we're all going to the same place. We're all trying to get to the same place. Our roots have slight variations, because we have slightly different obstacles. And yeah, there's this, this uh, the way I like to analogize this whole idea of Shastra and Guru is, you know, the, the Shastra is like a map, it's static, but it's fixed. And because of our minds, we will only see what's there and nothing more. And if we get lost, we get lost. We even stop being able to really understand where we are in the map. But with Guru, like the GPS, if you go off track, you reroute, you get rerouted from where you're at. This is what the spiritual master does for us. So it can be very helpful to have specific instructions around day to day activities. But however, the principle of Guru Tattva, and even the person, even our own particular Diksha Gurus, their mercy can come through our Shiksha Gurus because we can have Shiksha Gurus who are aligned with our Diksha Guru. I mean, ISKCON in general is moving more towards as our, you know, as we have more and more devotees and a wider spectrum, we are starting to have a system where devotees can have just as much Shiksha from their Guru as Diksha, right? And have a more cohesive, coherent God family. But how do we know which instructions are meant for us? While your Guru's on the planet, get clarification. So, I remember when uh, uh, Gurudev was, uh, you know, giving some instructions uh, in the final few months. There was one time he called me back again and asked me, he said, did you understand what I said? And I said, yes. And he said, just in case you didn't hear it as again. And he repeated the whole thing again. And I said, is that okay if I don't understand something to ask you? And he said, of course. He said, actually, it's essential. It's almost your service as a disciple that if you do not understand what the spiritual master is instructing you, that you get clarification. And if you still don't understand, and it's not because you don't understand what's being asked, but maybe you don't feel it's relevant right now. He said, file it. Because our consciousness evolves. We're in a growth process. And it may be that the Guru's instructed us something that either we aren't quite ready to receive yet, or it's being instructed to be planted to manifest at a later stage. I mean, one of the ways Gurus instruct is through dreams. Some Gurus instruct very consciously through dreams, and some Gurus instruct unknowingly, because again, that Guru, that the energy is working through that individual. And I asked him about this aspect that, you know, sometimes you will instruct in a dream. And I remember very clearly what you've said. And other times you instruct and I either forget when I woke, wake up or I wake up in the middle of you saying something. And he said, don't worry, because um, everything you need to know is there because Guru's instructions are beyond just what this mind and brain and ego process. They're really happening in a very separate heart space, not the physical heart, not the emotional heart, but our transcendental heart. And it will be activated, it will occur. So, but whilst your spiritual master is still on the planet, definitely, definitely take the time to write to them. Even if you can't physically meet them face to face, uh, take the time to get clarification from Shiksha Gurus who may be within your God family, who may be able to give you counsel and advice on that. Because remember, there are gonna be different people in each of our God families who've got different levels of personal training from the spiritual master. And part of the thing that the guru does with personal training is they also train the disciples to 
think and execute like them so that those disciples actually know okay well gurudev would do this and gurudev would say this and gurudev would respond like that so um does, does that help do you did you feel you can go and get some clarification absolutely it does help and i liked your very first point where you said that once we get initiated we think the the five basic instructions are too generic and not for me mm. and and there have been days where you know, um, I'm lucky to have uh, have my husband follow the same Gurudev and we are walking together. So the moment and on my bad days, we remind each other how good is your chanting, which is very, very helpful because if you are not chanting well, things seem to go haywire. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Krishna, thank you so much, uh, Mataji, for a, uh, such a wonderful class. Um, so I have, uh, so you asked a question like, how do you uh, feel personally that uh, what are the challenges in serving your mm -hmm. Guru Maharaj? Uh, so um, I don't have personal association with Guru Maharaj, um, like physical association, but um, since last year we have this daily class and uh, um, through um, through that Zoom only we are going, we are meeting Guru Maharaj daily and having his classes and association. But sometimes, um, suddenly, uh, if Guru Maharaj comes, uh, uh, when I have to serve physically, then I feel very, um, so as I didn't serve him before, I am very much in anxiety and <laughs> like my mind is giving all sorts of um, things like how you will do this, how without any help and uh, I'm, I'm really in anxiety. So is it really um, like like I I should have some faith on me and on Guru uh, Guru Maharaj and Krishna that they will also help me in serving um, Guru Maharaj, but uh, but I'm more in this anxiety mode that I'm unable to think properly. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, can you explain what is this all this Mataji? Uh, like uh, I'm unable to figure out. Um, <laughs> So it's funny, isn't it? How is it that this person I love so much, <laughs> I'm tripping up over my own anxiety to sin. Why is that happening? Surely my heart should be a flutter and I should be jumping for joy and be able to do everything perfectly. It feels like a, um, you know, a conflict, doesn't it? Yeah. So what's happening here? So one of the other ways that the, actually the most common way that the guru instructs, even more common than dreams and even more common than actually direct instruction and chastisement is um they chastise and instruct through consciousness mm -hmm. chastisement is correction isn't it it's different to displeasing the spiritual master again this was something the Maharaj took time to highlight he said you know Chief Shakti, there's a difference between being chastised by the spiritual master and displeasing the spiritual master chastisement means we are correcting okay we don't have to be upset to correct just like parents you know you you might correct your children you might not even be upset by what they've done but you what they've done but you just correct them but when the guru is displeased that's different right so but many people don't get the opportunity for that face to face or maybe can't tolerate that but the other way the guru in the most common way that gurus instruct is through consciousness what do we mean by this so the last thing a criminal wants to see is the police and when it comes to our minds and our consciousness, where is the barrier? The barrier is in the mind, right? All of the blocks we have are the things in the mind to do with misidentification, our spiritual ignorance, ignorance of who we are, our over-attachment to who we are here. And so when those things come under that bright spotlight of the spiritual master's purity, they get disturbed. They're like, uh-oh, uh the police is here. <laughs> This transcendental police and we feel that anxiety and it feels uncomfortable it's interesting because often when we aren't doing things properly when we need to associate with the spiritual master most that's often the time when the mind might even say to us don't go or we'll look for a thousand excuses but some of your anxiety is also your sincerity because you want to do it nicely you don't want to pour his drink and then it falls all over him. You don't want to trip while you're taking the plate to the dining table. So there's some of that anxiety. But again, if we really look at it from a psychological level, are we fearing making a mistake because we're worried about how we're going to look? 
or are we fearing and making a mistake because we don't want the spiritual master to get hurt or to not have a good quality of something because actually and this is really rather rani's mood she's so non-envious she's so much in the mood of whatever it is that pleases krishna i will make arrangements for that to happen even if i'm not doing it myself when we're doing service we can stop and check is my anxiety about my own humiliation or is it about guru they having the best now if it's about my own humiliation we can check that and say okay well you know swallow your pride and do, do the needful to calm ourselves down and serve nicely if it's i want to offer the best to my spiritual master then actually we'll get help because this principle of being servant of the servant and feeling and of the servant of the servant of the servant and feeling just as much joy as if we were doing something directly can really be had if our motive is i want my spiritual master to have the best even if i'm not the one doing it so there are many layers to that and it takes time uh for us to 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 uh develop that uh but it's just a, a few a few things to think about so there, there are a few reasons why we might get anxious but some of it is is chastisement correction it's good actually if, if we don't see someone as guru it's rare that we get that agitated around them right even if they're pure we don't um feel as much oh my god i shouldn't be around this person but where there's love and affection then that guru that's where that guru uh, guru shakti is is coming through does that does that make sense Lavanya? yes yes Mataji. yeah when guru maharaj is very sweet like um i i have confidence that he'll guide me in serving him but uh but uh, as this is my first time that's why i'm little in tension and anxiety but as you said, I want, um, I'm checking myself, like, um, that's a good point you mentioned, like, we have to check ourselves, whether it's for your humiliation, about your humiliation, or like serving actually the Guru Maharaj in best way. So I feel that I want to serve Guru Maharaj in best way, um, but I don't want to make any mistakes in that area. <laughs> so yeah. that's the main I'll, I'll share something, and it's embarrassing for me, because I'm really just showing my faults here. But there was this one time, I remember it so clearly, so I had a lot of personal service in those you know, last few months. I got used to being around Gurudev all the time and doing a lot of things. And it was one thing, oh God, I feel so embarrassed sharing this, but he can purify me. And there's this one thing, I was going to do it. And then somebody else came in and did it instead. And I watched them do it. Oh my God, the, how I felt in my heart it was like my heart was on fire, not in a good way. Okay. I left the room. And I thought, what is this feeling? It feels like somebody's taken hot coals and is burning my heart. And Guru Dev had warned us a few weeks before that, saying that, you know, the first couple of months of serving the Guru is fun and easy. But then the mind and ego really start to wreak havoc because you, you start to get familiar, you start to have expectations. I thought, what is this? At first, my mind went, yeah, yeah, look, look at you. You're so attached to your spiritual masters because you just, you wanted, you just want to do the service. That's all it is. And I thought, no, that's not, that's not right. It just, this doesn't feel like that. This feels horrible. Okay. This is not how joy is supposed to feel. And I thought, what, it, I, what I really, I thought, oh my gosh, it's envy. My interest wasn't that he should have the best. My interest was I should do it. As long as I'm doing it, that's fine. You know? And my gosh it was painful it was a burn like anything i mean third degree burn of the heart i'm telling you and uh it was but having that realization really it helped me for the rest of the service because it forced me to to check what's my motive what's my motive is this the best arrangement or is it just that i'm and am i greedy for service in the right mood you know is this about me or is this about guru then is this about something higher and actually and then as that lesson evolved and grew uh i said learning from guru that actually what pleases him most is that those disciples who facilitate the guru's relationships with other disciples right not blocks them not keeps them away but actually finds a way to which is exactly what happens in the spiritual world that this is our training ground here to learn how to live in cooperation not just cooperation but ever increasing ecstatic cooperation because this is how we by nature function you know when we are with 
Krishna and his associates and our big family in the spiritual world, this is how we associate with each other, where it's a love competition. We are seeing how can I love you more than you love me? Um, but I, 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 I hope that your service uh, goes smoothly and you don't get overwhelmed with anxiety. Hare Krishna. I think uh, Mark and Diptesh Prabhu have their hands up. Hare Krishna Mataji, thank you so much for giving such wonderful insights. <clears throat> um, I have a question on the topic that you were talking with Lavanya Mataji, that how to get rid <clears throat> of these um selfish feelings or these envious feelings because many times what i see is that when a devotee starts the spiritual life <clears throat> probably they are not aware of these things in their heart because maybe they have never thought so much about their own mm -hmm. selves about the dirt within them and then when you see other devotees you progress progress not progress in the real sense but probably somehow or other we come to a point where we have decided that we want to take initiation <clears throat> and sometimes before initiation or after initiation so during that spiritual journey that what i have experienced is that a lot of things were within me it's not that they were not there but then you see externally somebody behaving that way <clears throat> and that triggers it these kind of negative feelings as well so you mean like, like somebody's acting like a mirror yes mirror but you don't realize initially initially you would just blame other people you know that oh because i saw this devotee doing in this way that's why that's where i get the idea from otherwise i wasn't like this before um, <clears throat> but then slowly when you when you become more <clears throat> when you go more deeper within yourself as you progress in your spiritual life then you realize as you hear Prabhupada you realize that it should have been within you otherwise how can somebody else trigger it so there has there is always triggers triggers are there everywhere but <clears throat> definitely it was there within you so my question is that even though I know that chanting is the purification process but sometimes i still wonder that how to get rid of these things because <clears throat> when we are trying to get rid of these things we still have to work in cooperation with other devotees and you many times you still keep seeing these things and they make impression on your heart sorry on your consciousness and sometimes it is because of you sometimes it's triggered it's hard to make that distinction all the time but then how to how to constantly remind yourself of the right process mm. the right things to do thank you um so while you were speaking i was thinking yes our chanting takes care of clearing but when you clean when you spring clean your cupboard you replace it with something else Right? you replace the things that you remove with other things it's rare that you can spring clean a cupboard and just leave it empty <laughs> anybody has done any spring cleaning here you've probably cleaned a place and found it's gotten full again so this is why association is important because whilst we're cleaning we're clear clearing the sanskars in our unconscious mind the impressions from our unconscious mind our subconscious mind from previous lifetimes from earlier in this life and our day-to-day -day impressions in the conscious mind as we're clearing, what are we replacing it with? So this is where association, this is where reading is important. And again, these become things that we start to minimize. Uh, why? Because they don't feel unique. You know, the mind makes us think these are not these are not unique to me. Everybody does this. I've done it before. I know I can do it. Why, why do I need to carry on doing it? What else is there? You know, uh, I want something special. I want something different. So don't we start to take for granted the association we used to have that we used to think was so special and now oh, because it's available at all times, it's, uh, it's not so special anymore. I mean, somebody the other day was telling me that when lockdown started, I remember lockdown started, suddenly all these yatras opened their doors to anyone in the world to hear class. 
and everybody wanted to be everywhere. And now devotees were telling me that they get all the posters and everything and they get so much choice, they almost feel like I just don't want to watch anything because I can watch anything I want at any time. And the accessibility gets taken for granted, but also the expanse of choice makes them almost paralyzed. But there is also this power of association. If I'm cleaning, if I'm removing, what am I replacing with? Okay, so yes, there's always going to be things that we pick up knowingly and unknowingly and those things that have been festering for a while. But as we clean, what positivity are we replacing with? You know, are we going to spend time with the devotees where their love for Krishna and Guru is contagious? Where their ability to naturally not engage in prajalpa is contagious because they're so busy talking about wonderful things, they don't have time to criticize anyone where they're so busy serving, they don't have time to be engaging in activities that keeps them away from Krishna consciousness. Um, so I think this is maybe one way we can think about it. There's many ways we can approach this, but perhaps try this, that yes, we're cleaning with the holy name, but what are we replacing? Thank you so much. That was a really wonderful and perfect point that what we are replacing it with. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Um, devotees, any more questions or comments? Yes. Um, Mansi Mataji? I think she just had no, a problem. Yeah, I just thought <laughs> I just did my mistake. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kari, uh, oh, Navakishore is here. <laughs> Hi, Krishna. Chitty, it's wonderful to hear from you. I've, uh, uh, I'm actually driving, so I'll keep this brief. Uh, but I wanted to ask you um, about self-care uh, while you're taking care of your spiritual master and how, in difficult circumstances, uh, you were able to, uh, or a disciple is able to um, surrender themselves fully and at the same time uh, not go so far that they they either damage their health or their mental well-being. Mm. I mean, if I take it back to the first point uh, where accepting guru or surrender to guru is our willingness to have our life changed in an unplanned or even undesirable way. There are so many aspects to ourselves and yes keeping body and mind together is a very important part of executing our sadhana bhakti our service to the spiritual master but when we are directly serving the spiritual master there is a slightly different mindset because what we're also doing is we're offering up everything you know i remember guru Maharaj said you know Yes, every single, you know, we have this, this understanding that the guru is offering their spiritual master garland and every disciple is like a flower on that garland. But what he was also sharing is that but when there's personal service involved, the guru also sees the personal servants as um, parts of his body. He said, you know, you're, you're like parts of my body. So if I'm harsh with you, I'm sorry, but this is what I expect of myself. Um, so I think this is, I mean, I don't know if what I'm going to say is going to sound controversial or how it's going to come off, but this is what's in my heart. When we really surrender to Guru, there's got to be a, a there, I think it's helpful to have a wholehearted willingness to, okay, if there's a sacrifice in my health, then so be it. But by wholehearted, I mean wholehearted. What does wholehearted mean? That if there is a sacrifice in my health, then I'm, I'm not going to actually resent it. Wholehearted means that I know what possibly could come by me engaging in service on this level, but I'm not going to resent Guru for that. Half-hearted is where we want to do it, but we also want to preserve our health. If that's the case, I'm not saying that's half-hearted as in like one's not surrendered, but it could also be something you can discuss with the spiritual master. You can say, you know, I have to get up this early. I have to do this. I'm finding I'm getting very tired and I can't execute. 
uh, my service pro properly and I really want to serve you nicely, what can I do? You know, so there is room for, especially in personal service, there is room for conversation. I'll give you two examples. So one was, uh, so Gurudev came to stay with us for a whole week and it was all around the time that I got initiated. And the day I got initiated was Janmashtami. So Gurudev flew in at like four or five a.m. that morning and then he had the whole day at the house and then at about four or five in the afternoon we went to the manor we had the initiation and i asked gurudev i said gurudev do you want to stay here at the manor to break the fast or do you want uh to eat at home and he said we'll eat at home gurudev asked we didn't leave the temple until after midnight uh or maybe it was near midnight something like that so by the time we got back and I'd cooked and he was breaking his fast, it was two in the morning. And by the time I took, it was three in the morning. And then we had to be up again for Prabhupada's disappearance. And, so, and then we were fasting again. And I hardly took anything. I think by three in the morning, I just couldn't eat anything. And so we went for Prabhupada's disappearance. And as we went for Prabhupada's disappearance, we stayed for the whole program. Again, breaking fast was like at two in the afternoon that day. And I asked him, would you like to honor here or would you like to honor at the house? And he said, oh, I'll honor at the house. So by the time we got back and I cooked, he broke his fast at like four o'clock. By the time it came to me breaking fast, it was six o'clock. I took one spoon and he said, okay, she's Shakti, let's go. I'm going to go give class. <laughs> My god sister was there from America, Jambavati. And she, I was like, okay, okay, I'm coming. And she said, oh, Gurudev, she's literally just taken one mouthful. Can you give her a few more minutes? He said, okay. And I think he gave me about a few more seconds because I got one more mouthful in. And he came out and he he said, okay, Chi Shakti, let's go. I don't want to be late. And so we left. And then as we were driving, he said, you know, serving the spiritual master means no eating or sleeping. It's like a training because serving the spiritual master, especially when the spiritual master, and we'll talk about this, I think, in the more next session, more on Vapu, is when the guru has a prolonged period of time with someone. It's like attending boot camp. This identity is really pretty much broken down so they can remold us, um, depending on how moldable we are, how much time they have, et cetera, and provided the support structures are there. But then another time in his last um, few months, there was, I was going with him for all of his treatments. And I can't remember this name of this particular treatment, but there was this one treatment where, and this was before he knew the cancer had really fully spread. He would sit in front of this machine, which like released some, sound waves and electromagnetic rays ray waves which were supposed to kill the toxins in his uh system and i got the fallout from that because i'd sit at the side in the room so they would blast me too now they must be doing something but wherever there's a breakdown of cells there's toxins it makes your body has to clear out you get tired and i would find i would re i mean i'm normally full of beans but i would get so tired after those sessions and after a few days i said to myself guru they you know I'm going to stop either coming or is it okay if I stop coming or stop sitting in that room because actually it's affecting me to a point where I can't do the other services and I don't want to make a mistake in giving medication or anything like that and and, and he was fine with that because there was a dialogue about it so I think it depends on the circumstance but I I, I do feel like where there is a because what the guru is looking for which is the same as what Krishna is looking for is how much is our heart open to their intervention to their love because if our heart is really open to their intervention and their love then even if something may initially appear like it's destroying a certain part of ourselves in the long term it is always glorious and uh, you know i don't know how much longer this session is going to run but one thing I really did want to share about the guru disciple relationship is the guru reciprocates with us based on which aspect of the guru we want to connect with. If we are very interested in interacting with the physicality of the guru, we will get, the guru will reciprocate on that level. If we're very interested in reciprocating with or interacting with the mind of the thought process of the guru. That is what we'll get from guru. But if we want to serve the heart of the guru, then that's really where there can be some real exchange and nectar beyond words and beyond our circumstances and time and space here. Um, but Navakashura, I really appreciate your question because self-care is um, a big topic. 
And I'm addressing it more with the mood that we're not addressing exploitation or inappropriate, uh, you know, management of, of personal servants and things here. I'm going purely from a, where there's a healthy guru disciple relationship. That, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate that response. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, it's been more than a one hour, uh, Mark Mataji. So I'm um, the devotees here. Any more questions or comments? Okay. Yes, Mataji, I think um, no more questions or comments uh, here. Thank you. Um, thank you so much once again. Uh, Sukhava Mataji, you want to say anything? Yeah, yes, uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Chiti Sakshi Mother. It was amazing. And the points you brought up are so good. And I was just thinking about myself that actually all of them applies to me. All the negativity, all the negative points, like, you know, my ego, my like selfishness, everything you brought up. And it's so nice. So now, like, it makes me think that I should focus on all these things. Thank you so much for bringing it. Really Hare amazing. Hare a, you're so kind for giving me permission to speak freely with my heart open. I'm looking forward to uh, our next session. So next Monday is Radhashtami. So I don't yeah. think we'll be teaching, so at yeah. least not this one. I think you'll be speaking with Chandra Molly Maharaj. And then the following uh, week, we will be covering uh, Vapu as uh, so a service to the spiritual master and while the spiritual master is physically present. And then the last session will be um, serving the Vani and the eternal principle of guru disciple relationship so thank you so much Hare krishna thank you so much mataji Hare krishna such a lovely class and a nice question answer session oh, thank you so much thank you so much for your more sessions mataji. thank you thank you thank you so much mataji.